A próxima apresentação é do Luís Rodrigues, um hábito de Bruno Campos, pelo menos foi uma apresentação de alguns anos, não foi? Não sei se foi a única ou se já não foi todos, foi tudo. Hoje já falarmos sobre aquilo que em tempos era feito no fim dos projetos, por pessoas que até aí não tinham ouvido falar nesse projeto e que ganhavam ao bar e encontraram. Às vezes aconteceu. Pronto, sim, vamos falar de testes e novos paradigmas. Podemos chamar novas ideias, já que não vou dizer nada e tal, mas que só agora parece que só entrar mais no mainstream de, destas coisas. Ele vai fazer a apresentação dele em inglês e, portanto, vou fazer a apresentação também em inglês. Our next guest is Luis Rodrigues, software engineer based here in Lisbon. We'll be talking about the concept that, uh, although not new, is really becoming more prevalent in the software de development world in general, in general and uh, front web, uh, front end web development in particular, and that is uh, testing. So, we'll give a warm welcome to Luis. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this I'm going to be super brief because it's a big talk and I only have 20 minutes. So this is about React Testing Library. I'm uh, my name is Luis. I was introduced. I used to do a lot of WordPress work, not anymore. So what the hell am I doing here? I work at a company called Evil Experts. Again, we don't do anything related to do WordPress. Uh, we are a consultancy. We work with agile methodologies. We do a lot of stuff like extreme programming, pair programming, TBB. Uh, we try to get in with like, these flat structure teams and we interact a lot with our clients to try to get a simple solution to their problems. Um, so, what the hell does this have to do with WordPress? Well, uh, one of the technologies that we've been working with is React and React is you know, prevalent everywhere, including WordPress, with Gutenberg blocks and even these headless CMS solutions that are starting to show up, where you have a WordPress that serves as a backend uh, with the GraphQL or REST, <coughs> the REST API, that is then consumed by this JavaScript front end that's completely decoupled from the REST. And so uh, React's been gaining a lot of traction in, in, in WordPress, and I said, no, why not? Let's, let's talk about testing React components. And especially testing them with confidence. And uh, front-end testing in particular has been a little bit of a boogeyman in, in software engineering because it's not trivial, or it's historically it hasn't been trivial. You can write tests for back-end logic, it's pretty simple, you know, a function takes something, should output something, you test it, fine. But front-end, well, there's this web page, and there's this user flows, there's login and there's state to maintain, state to test. And historically, you've been doing some, setting up some stacks with, for example, Selenium. I don't know if you've heard of it. So what Selenium does is it, uh, it, it spins up a web browser and you then control the web browser to navigate the page for you and test you know, if the page is correct. Problem with this is that it's a hell of a setup Yes break if the page uh, breaks for some reason. Uh, it's tests are difficult to change your opinion, yes, especially if you're using something like Gutenberg. Uh, and they're really, really slow because you're interacting with a real application and you are uh, subject to all the delays and all the overhead that the application has with it. So you spin up the browser, you have to wait for it to load, and open the page, you have to wait for it to load. And if you just want to test like, a stupid button or a form field, it's a lot of overhead. And this kind of, if you do TDD, you want these feedback cycles uh, to be quick. You want to save the file, run the test automatically, and see if it fails, right, in, within a second, ideally. So we want tests to be readable, not as long. Gutenberg tests like you used to write with, with um, uh, Selenium or for Selenium. You want them to be robust. You don't want tests to break because, I don't know, a, a database failed somewhere and the site won't load. That's not good. And you want them to be maintainable because tests are your specification, specification changes, you have to keep those tests up to date, and you want them to be fast. Okay, so specifically to React. Um, there's a library that came up that was built on top of um, React test utils called Enzyme. And what Enzyme does is that it grabs 
uh, your component, renders it in isolation, and you're able to test it. You don't need a browser to do it. It all happens in your testing framework. So it, it generates like this pseudo HTML structure, and then you click the button, you fill out the form, you press submit, you check that everything's been called, you check that your, your component tree has the right structure. And it's really re readable, it's really convenient, it's really fast, because you don't depend on the browser to test, to test your application or your components. Um, but there's a problem with Enzyme, in that it's API, which is super powerful, but it does encourage some nasty um, practices. One of them is uh, testing implementation defects. Primarily, it's something called shallow rendering. Uh, but there's also um, uh, a few um, <coughs> methods that allow you to inspect a component state and write assertions on it. And the component state is not something that's exposed to the outside world, and as such, you're not supposed to test. So what is shell rendering? Um, shell rendering, uh, so let's, let's suppose that we have this fake form that's built in React. You have a form, and then inside you have a component for a file upload, and an input field, and a checkbox, and a submit button. And then the file upload behaves in such a way that when you drag a file onto it, it immediately starts a network request. Problem is, with unit tests, you want to unit test this, you have a side effect right here. So if you want to test the file uploads, you have to prevent or somehow intercept this request from being performed. So the solution is, well, the solution that Enzyme presents is you shall render the, the form. So the form will fake render the file upload, the input, the checkbox, and the submit button. They're there, but not really. So when you interact with the file upload, it doesn't do any network requests. And you're able to inspect the form and say, well, I want my form to have a file upload, check. You want my form to have an input, to check, and so on. And when I drag the file into the file upload, I want to call back so and so to be called. This never happens, you intercept it, everyone's happy. Until you have to change your form. If you put everything inside a field set, shell will render, then shell will render the field set, not the rest. So all the tests that you had to check the file upload, the input and the checkbox will break, even though you didn't do anything that actually changed the form in any meaningful way. Right? <coughs> so then you have to do this nasty stuff called dive. You dive to force it to render the, or fake render the file <coughs> code, you put etc. Et but this is like, you're not supposed to be changing tests when functionality doesn't change. You just move stuff around. So this brittleness, you want to avoid it. And it, it, it limits your ability to refactor, really. It, it's the same thing with React components or functions. If you look too deeply into the implementation details of a function in order to test it automatically, if you look into the implementation details, if you mock internal dependencies, like you, you refactor something and the test will break for no reason. And then you get annoyed and say, you know, screw these tests, I'm, I'm dropping them about doing them again, because it's a pain in the butt. And you, out or you, you prevent yourself from refactoring the code because I don't want to refactor this because it will break the test. <coughs> you can't do that. No, refactor is how you address technical debt. You don't want to be prevented and that should, should help you to, to um, refactor your code with confidence knowing that stuff is not going to break. There's some other problem. Uh, so this is what I talk, talked about. There's another problem with this, is you have an internal component that's an external dependency, some module that you've you know, pulled from an NPM or something like that. You're using it. With shell rendering, you write your test in such a way that you don't have to interact with third-party component, which makes kind of, kind of makes sense. You're not supposed to test uh, other people's code. But if that third-party component breaks, your application breaks it, you have to make sure that whatever you include in there still works. 
So you don't have to test it, but you have to make sure you know, things are okay. So does this mean I have to write these integration tests for my components? Well, there's a bit of a... It's, it's hard to describe what an integration test actually is. Uh, there's this... Uh, I think it was either Kent Bash or Martin Fowler, one of the HL tests, and went to a workshop and they asked around, you know, what, what's your definition of an integration test? They got like 20 different answers. So it's, it's, it's a very fuzzy boundary between, you know, on the testing period. This testing period means that if you test stuff through the UI, you get slower tests that cost more to maintain. Whereas if you write unit tests, which is like testing an individual function or an individual class or a module, then you get really fast tests that are very straightforward to read and cheap to maintain. Although you're not testing all the integration of things. But it's, 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 it's a very blurry thing. It's something to again agree on. So a unit test must run in isolation. A unit test must focus on a, a small part of the system. And a unit test must be fast. This, these things are generally agreed upon. Even the definition of unit test is kind of fuzzy. But what does unit mean? You know, a lot of developers look at unit and think, now I have to test every function, I have to test every class, I have to test every isolated component, and that's not what a unit is. So when you, ad uh, when you adopt a strategy of testing your components using Enzyme, you go down this rabbit hole, and uh, usually with not so good results. Because you tend to test every single component that you have, even though you might not need to. So a unit is whatever makes sense to you, makes sense to your project. Even within a project, a certain component might require a unit test that's a little more higher level than the other ones. And if you adopt a like, different way to look at this, when you do test driven development, you write a test before you write implementation, right? And are you familiar with TC? <coughs> Anyone does PDD? Okay. So you write one test for this, and then you write the implementation to make the test pass, then you write another test, and so on and so on. But when you write the test, you're not explicitly looking for dependencies. It's like, it's whatever it takes to make the test pass. It doesn't matter how many subcomponents, whether it's components or other functions or whatever. It doesn't matter which subcomponents, whether they're first party or written by someone else. Like, you're not going to mock load hash uh, because you need a function term. Just you know, include it as if you had written the whole thing yourself. So as long as the interface of your component or your function doesn't change, when I refactor it, tests should break. That's um, the ideal scenario here. Because like I said, refactoring is key if you want to address technical depth later on. So when you write a test for, for a component, and then you rewrite the component, clean up the code to, I don't know, uh, make it more efficient. Uh, test shouldn't break because the behavior doesn't change. So I'm skipping this test already. Okay. So enter React Test and Library. And uh, React Testing Library was actually the driver uh, of what is now a, a family of testing libraries, not just React. And it was created by a guy called Can't See Dots. And he has this quote that tweeted, the more your tests resemble the way your software is being used, the more confidence they can give you. And this testing your code from the perspective of the end user is really, really powerful. Uh, React Testing Library depends on JS DOM. Uh, which is bundled by default in a, in a test runner like Jest. If you use Jest, it's just you know, plug and play. Otherwise, it's mostly you know, test runner agnostic, but you might have to do some, some work. And it provides a set of primitives that mimic this user behavior that you want to test. So for example, you have general queries. You can get something by the text. You can get something by its title, like the, the title attribute in HTML. Uh, you can get something by an alt text, like an image, uh, or by its area role uh, that you should include for accessibility. 
And same thing for fields, you can get an element by the label, you can get something by the value that it's displaying at the moment, or by the placeholder text. And this is like searching by text, or searching by a regular expression. There are no CSS selectors, you don't need to know whether the button is inside a div, or whether the, there's a class, a special class or a special ID, it's all, it's the same way as a user. A user goes on your site or your application, they don't care if it's a div, if it's, if it has class X or the ID black, right? But they do see the text, and that's the driver of these tests. So, is it a link, is it a button, who cares if it's clickable? There's a, an escape hatch, if you can't use text, you can set a test ID. And having a separate test ID, although not ideal, it's better than relying on something that's, that's being used for something else. So if you have an ID that you use uh, for your uh, functionality or a class that you use for styling, if you make your tests depend on that, like you're, you're putting a chain around it and, and you won't be able to later change that class without duplication. And what you get back from these this functions is the actual DOM nodes. Unlike Enzyme, which would just this object simulation uh, with a bunch of confusing methods and structure, um, what you get back is the actual DOM nodes as if you had run like a query select on the browser. Same thing. And then you can interact with it. You can fire events. Click, drag, uh, double click, uh, I don't know. Whatever. However, so example, this is from an actual project. You can see all the code, but it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. So what you, what you're testing here is deleting something and then confirming it and making sure that deletion happens. You have a setup step. You get some test data. It doesn't matter what. We just care about the ID. Uh, you create a mock function. Uh, that's called handle delete, and then you render using uh, React testing library. You render your component, you pass it to fake data, you pass it to fake function, and you get this, uh, these methods that you're going to use to interact with it. Then it's as simple as you click on a button on anything that's, that has delete on it, and then you wait for the confirm button to appear because it's a pop up and maybe there's some animation and, or delay or something like that. And then you, you wait for the handle function to be called with the ID that you prefer. That's it. Pretty straightforward to read or change even if, if anything changes. And it doesn't matter what you use to delete. Is it a link? Is it a button? It can change. It won't break the test. Because your test is focusing on what matters. So React Testing Library encourages you to not, to not test implementation details. It encourages good accessibility practices because it will force you to provide clear and ambiguous labels for your buttons. So if you have two buttons that are called delete but do different things or slightly different things, maybe you need to work on that. Um, and as well as adopting, you know, uh, area roles and stuff that you can actually use to query the, the, the elements on the page, as if you were an actual user. It's very simple. It's very lightweight, it's blazing fast. Ensign is fast too, but you know, this has a nice idea. Yeah. So there are some challenges that come with this. One of them is combinatorial explosion because you're testing the component at a higher level. Let's suppose that your form has some validation code in it. You would have to test the validation code through the form in all of the ver it's possible variations. So you can force you to write very similar tests for the same thing. Uh, it's something you should watch out for. Maybe it's worth testing the validation code in isolation and then just write a simple test to make sure that validation is going on for the form. You don't have to do everything. Uh, the idea is that you know, there's some other brittleness where you change one thing and 10 tests break. So if, in our example, if your validation code broke, it would break all the tests. For the, for the component, uh, even though it's not really related to the component, and it would be harder for you to determine exactly what was failing. And this, this unhelpful feedback will delay your, your 
dependent. So try to keep things as separate as possible. Unfortunately, there's no formula uh, or you know, uh, a rule for this. You have to figure out what makes sense in the context of your project. There's a bunch of examples. You can go on React testing the examples. It gives you it gives you um, a comparison between the, the same tests written for Enzyme and React testing library and other frameworks with and without, re, uh, uh, for example, Redux, which is quite popular, uh, with uh, uh, internationalization, for example, which can be a challenge. So there's a few examples here. If you're kind of lost and you don't know how to integrate these tests with uh, some other uh, libraries in the, in the React ecosystem, it's pretty good resource. It's framework agnostic. It's, it's based on something called DOM testing library, which is under the hood. So if you don't re use React at all, or if you don't use any particular um, uh, library, you can still use DOM testing library, which is, gives you the same, uh, the same kind of um, uh, APIs. As for front, uh, for um, Angular, React, Svelte, Vue, uh, also for stuff that isn't front-end specific, so if you use Cypress to, to, to do your end-to-end -end tests, you can use this. Gives you the same nice API where you can select by name. Uh, also for, for Puppeteer and Testcafe and, and uh, for React Native, which isn't based on DOM at all. So I really love it, and it's, it's got a delightful API. It discourages you, discourages you from testing implementation details, which can lead you know, to breaking tests and tests that break for no good reason. You want to have your tests to be clear and precise about what went wrong, so that you can go there and fix it. And also, it encourages accessibility in your components because it forces you to go through, uh, to interact with your components and go through them as if you were an actual user. So. Either there's, there's good verbal uh, uh, textual cues in your component, or otherwise there's sufficient accessibility um, properties set, area roles, for example, to, to titles, alt text, and so on, to make sure that um, it's, it's, it's doing the correct thing. And it's not a silver bullet, it's not perfect. I mentioned some of the drawbacks I mentioned couple of ways you can uh, get around them. There are trade-offs. So React testing library would be somewhere in the middle of this, not really no close to the bone unit testing. Uh, but it's a trade-off. And it's a trade-off that you would have to make when you're writing your test. It's, it, it's, there is no formulas. You have to think about what you do and what you want to get out of tests. If you want to get out your tests to um, give you confidence in refactoring, confidence to deliver code without having to manually test all the time. And you want to get to a state where, for example, you write all of your components on your editor with unit tests running without ever opening the browser. And when you open the browser, everything just works. It's great. It's a great feeling. And you can do that with tests, but you have to um, you have to be a little dis disciplined because it's not just writing unit tests, it's writing the right unit tests. So figuring out where exactly you want to move is key here. And there's some great stuff here. It, it, it prevents you from making basic mistakes, like unlike Enzyme does, and Enzyme is great, but it is a foot can and you don't want to shoot yourself in it. And, um, that's it. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question. Yes. A lot of pressure. Two minutes, one month. Yeah. Yep. Hi, thanks. Thanks for giving me talk in English. Um, what if you want to test a component that uses a Redux library? So it depends on with select, with dispatch. So it's not an isolated component. It's so not it's strong dependency on so, the content. Yeah, it depends on what again what test you want to write. You could write a single test that. So you could mock. Uh, you could mock the Redux methods if you want. Uh, also, you could leave the Redux methods in there and test everything through the component. 
problem that I deal, uh, but consider this. What if you one day you want to replace Redux with something else? Then you have a bunch of tests that don't even care if it's Redux behind the scenes, right? And you could rewrite everything with uh, 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 React hooks and, and get you the same results without breaking the test. And that's, that's pretty powerful. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like combinatorial explosion. If there's a lot of stuff going on in Redux, maybe you want to test some stuff directly, some, some uh, reducers directly or some, some middlewares directly, and try to find the right balance between uh, on, the, on the React part of, of the rendering um, process and whatever is more complicated or more complex, test it directly on Redux. Yeah. Uh, but from my experience, um, we did in the project decide to move away from Redux and having too many tests uh, looking at Redux itself was, was a pain in the pocket. We wanted to move away from it and we have to rewrite all the tests to look at the component and then we were free to uh, actually start replacing some Redux with, for example, React Hooks, which made code much simpler, but because we're testing Redux, not the component itself, and not the application itself, it was... It was okay, thank you, Luis.